All right, Mr. Rotter, thank you so much for being with us. Good morning. So can you, before we get into the petition process and how all that works, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure, uh, I've done election stuff starting in the late eighties when I actually ran for office in Bucks County. And then in this century, I've um, limited my practice to election matters and constitutional issues surrounding first amendment political speech. Um, I, I've, I've handled innumerable election related questions, uh, a lot dealing with petitions, both prosecuting a challenge and defending challenges. I've represented Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, the Green Party, Independents, and the Socialist Workers. Okay, so how does the petition process work for people who aren't familiar with it? Well, to get ballot access, you have to, in Pennsylvania and a lot of other states, you have to circulate nominating petitions for uh, the primary, that's the Democrats and Republicans. If you're a third party or independent, you circulate nomination papers, which is basically a document almost identical to a nomination petition, uh, slight differences. But for the sake of this discussion, I'll just talk about the uh, nomination petitions for Democrats and Republicans. Um, the election code, specifies by office how many signatures you need. In Philadelphia, it's the only first class uh, city in the state, in the Commonwealth, excuse me, you normally have to get a thousand signatures for any office, except for district uh, council, you only need 750. In reality, you need two or three times that. Uh, it's been my experience in doing petition work all over the state. I mean, from Philadelphia to Erie and every place in between. Um, the error rate for petitions, and this is just common mistakes, like you're not a registered voter, you're not registered in the district, you're not registered at your address that's in the shore system. Um, there's a approximately 30% error rate. If I get to a candidate before the petition process starts, I highly recommend that they get a street list and do it that way. It's a little more time consuming, but you're, they're gold-plated signatures as far as most people are concerned uh, because you have the record right in front of you when you knock at the door and you know that they're a Democrat or a Republican. In Philadelphia, the error rate tends to be 50%. Hmm. Um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, most of them common. Uh, a lot of times, uh, candidates and politicians like to throw around, there was fraud on the petitions. That's baloney. It's usually just a common mistake. Um, meaning, you know, the person's not registered in that party. They don't live in the district. Uh, they're not registered at that address. Uh, they forget to fill in a line, forget to put in a date. A common mistake is somebody will put in the zip code instead of a date, and then the next five people down the line will put the zip code in. Well, you, you can just strike those, those lines from a petition. Um, it, it, it's a tedious process, and it's done in the dead of a Pennsylvania winter. Uh, mm -hmm. When I talk about the subject, I, I mentioned um, I was circulating a petition for Governor Casey, I guess in 1990 in uh, Lower Bucks County at the Bristol Pathmark, I think, as I recall. It was a really cold day. And silly me, I only brought one pen. Within a half an hour, my pen froze. I had to go into the store, buy a pack of big pens, and come <laughs> back outside and start all over again with the you know a new pen that froze in a half an hour so i was swapping out pens uh the entire morning i was there um once you collect the at least the minimum number you can then file your petition with the appropriate authority it's either if you're running for any state office that includes uh all the judge races you have to file in harrisburg 
any city or local race, you have to file in the county with the Board of Elections. And one of the things that's part of the package, you have to file your nominating petitions with the minimum, with, with at least the minimum number of signatures. You have to file a statement of financial interest and you have to file a candidate's affidavit. Those latter two documents can also cause you a lot of problems. Uh, in this cycle, there are a number of people who neglected to, the, the candidate's affidavit is the only document that has to be notarized. At one time, every petition page had to be notarized. That's, uh, the courts started eliminating that. And then uh, when they revised the election code in 2019, they took that out. So just, you sign an affidavit, uh, or you sign the circulating, the sign is the circulator and you agree to be subject to process if the petition is challenged and you have to be subpoenaed. Um, the other thing that causes problems is the statement of financial interest. Uh, I don't know who devised that form, but it's, it, it, I, when I worked for the state, I was at the attorney general's office and the Pennsylvania Department of Health for a few years we had to fill out those forms every year and it would take me at least four attempts to fill it out properly. Uh, it's, it's, it's a hideously designed form, but uh, you know, they want to, what they're looking for is any potential conflicts of interest you might have. That form, when you're a candidate, you have to file a copy of that form with your petitions and then if you're running for state office, you have to go file the original with the state ethics office. I believe you can do that online now. And if you're running for local office, you have to file it with um, the governing body's office, like uh, the county commissioners. Uh, in Philadelphia, there's a clerk of records office that so has to be filed. Four years ago, Daryl Clark forgot to his whoever he sent down to file his petitions forgot to file the statement of financial interest with the clerk's office just down the hall from where they filed it. He came within 15 minutes of getting bounced off the ballot four years oh. ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, and that's a fatal mistake. There's no way around that. If you're challenged, you, you are DOA on that issue. Okay. So, what are some of the things that are commonly challenged in addition to signatures? Could, can it be the forms? Um, and, and how does that work? Well, a, a typical challenge is a page and line thing. You have to be precise. And uh, the Commonwealth Court has issued a standing order, as has the uh, Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. They also have a standing order about this type of, you have to list page one, line one, the signatures challenged for not registered in district, not registered, not a registered Democrat or other. If you do other, you have to then specify what that is. But there's a list of about 12 things that are standard challenges that can be found in those standing orders by the Commonwealth Court and the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. Um, if you can also challenge the candidate's affidavit, one of the things that I've seen um, you know, there, yeah, you know, what, what's your occupation? <laughs> That's also on the preamble uh, to your nomination petition. The, um, a, a couple of cases arose in the last 10 years dealing specifically with the occupation. And uh, in one case, a candidate for state rep put down that he was a lawyer. However, he was not a lawyer. He was a law student who had taken the bar and the results were not out yet. So the Supreme Court took a really dim view of that. Uh, I believe in the Bob Gazzardi case, he was challenging Tom Corbett in the Republican primary. He, he put down, um, 
he was also a member of the bar, but he was retired. And they, well, they got him on something else, but as a side, side note, they mentioned that, oh, by the way, you're not a lawyer, you're retired. They, the courts really hammered those people on those particular issues. So you have to be, um, I, to me, it's not that difficult, but given all the new job titles we have with people who are in the computer business, I, I've seen some strange things that, well, okay, you know, I, I have, I have no idea what that is, but if you tell me that's what you do, okay. Well, and, and you know, something just popped into my mind. This is a question Denise and I had last week. So, if, if somebody submits petitions that are obviously not solid you know uh, maybe it's the same handwriting on every form something like that is there so an internal a little aside on that particular thing you can hold a petition at arm's length as long as you've done this well and the in the hand of another meaning somebody writes the same information or the legendary kitchen table jobs they just jump off the page at you you can see mm -hmm. the the identical handwriting it's not that difficult but if they're not challenged are they just accepted and, and there isn't a mechanism internally to, to say, well, no, we can't accept these? Uh, they have to be challenged. The, mm. what, what happens at the Board of Elections or the State Department is they review uh, the petitions. They'll, they'll take off facial defects, like if a line's incomplete or somebody drew a line through that line striking the signature you know what they basically do is they count to the minimum that's required and then just say okay you have enough you have your other documents and you have a cashier's check for the filing fee you're on the ballot then you have seven days to challenge those petitions so everybody works at a breakneck pace looking at the petitions anybody who comes in less than like if you needed 250 signatures out in the counties to run for judge if you come in with 275 i guarantee your petition will be challenged because under my the the otter 30 percent rule you're not going to have enough signatures and that usually plays out correctly um the best challenges <clears throat> are the ones that are based on um, the review of the records in the SURE system, that's the statewide uniform registry of electors, um, that you're not registered in the party, you're not, not registered period, you're not a registered Democrat or registered Republican, as the case may be. Those signatures are dead on a Uh, I think you your your audio cut out there for a second. Oh, uh, there we go. Oh, sorry about that. It, the in hand of another or illegible, those are those are always coin tosses. Uh, mm -hmm. You like to see the ones that are, as they say, hard challenges to things that can be resolved by looking at the the card in the sure system. Uh, if mm -hmm. it comes down to uh, the signatures, that's also, you know, part of the voter registration card. If you've done this a while, you can make, make an argument without an expert handwriting person that the, the signature doesn't match what's in the um, SURE system. Uh, a while back, the Department of Transportation, when they had, you know, the motor voter laws, the the signatures that came in through that were hideous. And uh, I think anytime I ever challenged one and it came up that the you know, the voter registration came through the pen dot, the, the judges would just strike the signature. They, they don't match. Uh, the pen dot has improved the process, but still, um, you know, scribbling, you know, your signature on a, uh, video screen with your fingernail, eh, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, I have seen signatures that have been challenged as illegible 
and you're able to find the actual card based on the person's address. Um, they've been dead matches. I mean, things that you you couldn't imagine. Now this can't be the person's signature. You pull up the card and sure as hell it is, which always infuriates the other side. Sure. But, um, okay. Uh, I'd like to bring Denise Clay Murray here on Philadelphia Hall Monitor. Yes, um, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. Sure. Um, last week, because Larry and I were, were sitting in there um, on Friday listening to all of the petition challenges, one of the things that interested me was when the judge told the people with the the people who were challenging that they had to go to Delaware Avenue and try to work this out. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. That's part of you know, the standing order in Philadelphia and in the Commonwealth Court for any state offices. You go down to Spring Garden and Delaware Avenue and uh, go to the voter registration office where they keep all the records. They will give you one of their persons to uh, work the computer and you just look at the um, you know page one, line one, Here's the information we have, and you attempt to find that that card. And um, the the people who work in the voter registration office are incredibly knowledgeable about every street in Philadelphia. They're they're sometimes very helpful in finding out um, if you can't read the signature what the street is, and they they know that it's north, south, east, west, or whatever. And they will pull up that card, and then you you see are they registered? Are they? You look at what the challenge is, and then um, you would um, try to agree or say that no, we'll have to let the judge decide this. Basically, you know, in the in the one challenge I had, there were over thirteen hundred signatures. That takes a couple of days to review, and the you know, 20 years ago, the judges used to do that themselves in court. Then they got smart and said, no, you guys do this. And if you can't agree, come back here. Well, invariably, if you have two knowledgeable practitioners in election law, you can probably resolve, I would say, at least 50% of the challenges that way. So you've cut the, you've cut the judge's job down in half, at least. If if you can't work it out. A lot of times you will see that, um, you know, either your challenge is gonna fail or the candidate doesn't have enough signatures and everybody just folds their hand at that point. You either withdraw your petition or the candidate withdraws. Now, if, the, if there is a petition challenge and the judge rules that that person should be, that that challenge is a valid one, um, can the person who has been challenged appeal that decision? And if so, where and how long do they have? Uh, the, the normal time period under the rules of civil procedure, I believe is 20 days. In election law, you have 10. Uh, oh, and interestingly, the rules of civil procedure do not apply in election cases because you're looking to do things very quickly um, for the obvious reason is the ballots have to be printed and shipped out to uh, the armed forces and people who have requested a mail-in ballot or absentee ballots. So uh, it, it takes a while to organize each ballot and you have, I don't know how many different council districts in Philadelphia. So in, in this go around, you would have at least, I don't know, 10 or 15 different forms of the ballot to fit into each district. When you have state rep races, they're tighter districts. So you're going to have, uh, in Philadelphia, you're gonna have a lot more uh, different types of ballots. So that's, and the courts are well aware of that problem. That's why speed is the operative term. At the same time, it, it's, um, the court has agreed that we take a liberal view of interpreting these challenges. And we, if um, there is a question 
the candidate usually gets the benefit of the doubt so that the people can decide if they stay on the ballot. Okay. Now, were you, when, when you decided to go to law school, was election law kind of your focus and how did you get into that? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, they don't, not too many law schools teach election law. There, there are a few that will have that as an elective. Uh, I went to Temple Law School. We did not have, or at least I was not aware of a course in election law, you know, 40 years ago when I went to Temple. They, they may have a course in that now. I, I don't know. Um, it's become a hotter topic for the obvious reason since, you know, at least uh, Bush v. Gore in 2016 and 2020. Um, there are a lot more uh, permutations to this, but like I said, the petition process is the, without a valid petition, you don't get on the ballot. So that's step one, you gotta do that right. Yes. Uh, now, having said that, uh, one of the more interesting cases I had in 2016, I represented Governor Kasich, who was governor of Ohio, who was running for president. Um, his petitions were terrible, but the challenge to it was even worse because um, you have seven days from the last day to file nominating petitions you have the right to file a challenge to those nomination petitions. Somebody filed a challenge, but they have to be filed by five o'clock in Harrisburg for a presidential race or any other state race like US Senate, Congress, judges, whatever. Um, the individual showed up late at the, you also have to serve the Secretary of State's office by five o'clock, personally serve them. So I, 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 one of the very first cases I did that involved that issue, I made the mistake of FedExing it in that day. And I was quickly disabused of my standing to bring the challenge by the, the late Greg Harvey, who was the lawyer that's credited with making election law a big deal in Pennsylvania. Um, I, whenever I, it's election season, you know, in even numbered years when you're going to have uh, state reps, the governor, presidents, Congress, Senate, stuff like that. I, I set up shop in Harrisburg in a, in a hotel or an office. Uh, so I have my war room is there. All I have to do is walk across the street to the Capitol and then go over to the State Department and the Commonwealth Court to file the necessary paperwork. Um, but in the Kasich matter, the service on the Secretary of State was time stamped in at 5.13 p.m. Um, also, the petition that was filed, it was filed electronically. That wasn't filed until I think 6.20 p.m. So both were late filings under the election code. Um, you very rarely file motions in election cases. In this case, I did. I filed a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. The filing with the Secretary of State and the court timely is a jurisdictional requirement. Um, the, um, the case never was decided. So it's still an open question is, what does five o'clock mean on the seventh day after the uh, end of the petition period? Uh, that's yet to be resolved. There are a couple of cases, I'm aware of one right now in Northumberland County, uh, the district attorney may or may not have filed late. Uh, that, that's being litigated um, in this cycle. Now, you would think that if you're going to run for office, there you would know exactly what you need to do to avoid ending up challenged and in court. Um, why, why don't people know this stuff? I mean, 
particularly the ones that get me are incumbents. If you're an incumbent, you have done a petition drive before. So why are you in court? <laughs> well, you screwed something else up. I don't know what, but uh, uh, I have challenged a lot of incumbents and the incumbents have gotten a lot smarter. They now have hired me to represent them <laughs> prior to uh, you know, the petition period. But it, there, there's a whole lot of reasons. Uh, I, I think it comes down to, you know, you just kind of forget what you need to do. And that could, could be fatal as it could have happened to uh, city council president Clark four years ago. He, like I said, he was within 15 minutes of getting bounced off the ballot. Um, the, the challenge was never filed, but if it had been filed, he was dead on arrival. Well, thank you so much for you know sharing some of your time and your expertise with us. <laughs> okay, glad to help. And I'm going to give you back to Larry Glenn, Larry McGlynn, and you're listening to Hall Monitor on WPPM 106.5. All right, Mr. Rodder, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, you're welcome. All Last right, chance on a question. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this, though, really quick. Um, so it, it, if the council president hadn't filed that form, would he still have gotten on the ballot if there wasn't a challenge? Yes, he was on the ballot, but it if he had been challenged, he wouldn't have been on the ballot four years ago. I Everybody see. knew that. <laughs> I see. I see. All right. Well, Mr. Otter, thank you so much. Okay. Glad to help. Stay well. All right. Have a good day.